So a lot of names going around the NCAA basketball transfer portal, and Tennessee is linked to several of them. How Tennessee has emerged as a true candidate for one in particular. We'll tell you that and more here on a Wednesday, Locked On Vols. You are Locked On Vols, your daily podcast on the Tennessee Volunteers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, good Wednesday morning, everybody. Welcome to Locked On Vols. I am Eric Kane. So happy to be speaking and hanging out with you guys here this morning, whether you're on your way to work, in your cubicle, working out. Maybe it's Wednesday afternoon. Maybe it's Thursday or Friday. Beautiful thing about podcasting is you get to choose when you want to listen uh, to my annoying self. So I appreciate you for listening to us. But hopefully you're making Locked On Vols your first listen here on a Wednesday morning, your first watch on Locked On Vols YouTube channel. We are uh, free, absolutely free to watch, listen, subscribe, follow all that and more wherever you get your podcasts. And of course, on the Locked On Vols YouTube channel. Uh, today's show, got a lot going on. Grant Ramey, my colleague over at VolQuest.com, going to join us in a matter of seconds to break down the latest with Tennessee in the transfer portal. Tennessee Vols in the NFL draft. Jalen Wright, Joe Milton, Kamal Haddon, McCown Castles. What's the latest buzz on Tennessee with the draft coming up at the end of this week? It really snuck up on us. And then Ward Wednesday in segment number three. Big shout out to Monopoly Yo. The mobile hit twist on Classic Monopoly, where you can join your friends. Download Monopoly Yo today. Now it's free in the App Store and in Google Play. Without further ado, Grant Ramey giving us the latest on Tennessee basketball in the transfer portal. Grant, Igor Milicic. Tennessee, the favorites at the time of this recording. Of course, things can move a mile a minute. If Tennessee were to land the big man, what is Tennessee getting? Uh, size, 6'10", first of all. Uh, a guy that can step out and shoot it. I can't remember the exact percentages, but it's something like around 37, 36, 38, whatever. Uh, last season at Charlotte. Um, a guy that you would very badly need. Obviously, they've been after him for a couple of weeks now. They've been after Cade Tyson as well. They're kind of similar players. Uh, I think Igor is a little bit more of a four who can step out and shoot it, whereas Cade Tyson is six seven. He's a little bit more of a three that could step in and, and give you some minutes at the four and play a little bit of the four. Uh, so if Tennessee did land Igor, that would be a big deal uh, because Baylor is after him. They hosted him on a visit last, and they did uh, last weekend, that is, and they did not get anything done there. Uh, so I think that's a big deal. Nebraska was kind of in on him a little bit earlier than Tennessee was, I believe, and got him on campus for a visit. So – uh, pretty highly sought after talent. He gives you size. He gives you uh, uh, minutes and production at a position of need, obviously at the four with what Tennessee has lost in the front court and is looking to replace. So I think it would be a big deal. You mentioned this on the uh, on the Monday Night Chat a couple of nights ago, and at one time maybe it wasn't, but now maybe it is. If And knowing it's an uphill battle with Carolina, with Kate Tyson, but if Igor and Kate Tyson both won it in, Tennessee would probably say, come on down, right? Yeah, I think so. I think when it started, uh, yeah, like I was talking about the other night, I do think when it started, it wasn't either or. Like, they're going to get Igor or they're going to get Cade Tyson or, or whoever claims a spot first or, you know, how, how recruiting works. Like, if Igor wants to commit, you take that commitment and you can't wait on Cade Tyson because there's a chance Cade Tyson picks Carolina and then you've lost Igor, you've lost both players. Uh, I still feel like it's going to be hard to beat Carolina. I think Tennessee's uh, had a better shot maybe than most people gave him credit for, and they are in it a little bit more thicker than people thought uh, and there still seems to be some mixed opinions where some people think maybe Carolina's got it done some people think maybe he's torn some people think maybe he's signed NIL stuff some people think he's not even negotiated NILs until he's uh, picked whichever school program he wants to go to um, but at this point uh, I, I, it's still hard for me to imagine they get both of those players I do think they get Igor Milicic from Charlotte uh, I don't know about Cade Tyson and I also think Tennessee is trying to walk a line where they don't want to be a program that uh, feast every year in the portal. They want to be a program that uh, recruits prep players, signs them, and develops them over multi-year, uh, multiple seasons, multi-year players. Um, they don't want to – and I think if you take Igor and if you could get Cade Tyson as well, I think you run the risk of maybe they take minutes away from somebody who ends up in the portal a year from now, somebody that's currently on roster. And I don't think Tennessee wants to – uh, completely recruit over, you know, they got a lot of slots to fill, but they don't, I don't think they want to recruit over some of the talent they have on roster that they believe in, like a JP Estrella, a Cam Carr. Uh, they're, they're high on the upside of those guys. They want to keep them around. They want them to, uh, they want those guys to have minutes next season. So that's another kind of dimension of all this thing as you're trying to figure it out. So, and again, I'm thinking hypotheticals here, but it would almost be impossible for Tennessee to get all th both of those guys and then bring back Toby Awaka, 
latest on Tobe, kind of where he is. It feels like he's kind of going through the process. And I mean, I think somebody said it earlier this week. I mean, everybody loves being courted, right? Everybody loves being popular right. and, you know, sending you flowers and stuff. It feels like that's kind of what Tobe is doing right now. Yeah. And I think it's kind of to the point where, and I think a lot of people said this and I agree with it, that if it was going to happen by now, it would have happened by yeah. now. If he would have, if he would have kind of, you know, whatever changed course. And I do think those conversations have happened and he's talked with the Tennessee coaching staff, but it just feels like if he was back by now, it would have happened. And one problem for Toby Awaka, uh, we're recording this on Tuesday. Tennessee's scheduled to begin a, an official visit with Felix Akpara on Tuesday, the Ohio State Center. And he's 6'11", he's 225. He's a guy that averaged, you know, six uh, points, five rebounds, something like that, uh, maybe six and six, and 2.4 blocks. And he's 6'11". So if you get him, and I think Tennessee was one of the early favorites for him based on how they recruited him, um, two years ago as, as a prep prospect, and he has some ties to Chattanooga uh, with his prep days and with his family. Um, if you get him, then it's going to be hard for me to imagine Tobey comes back because it feels like that's the slot he would be filling. So they got to restock the front court if Jonas is gone. Uh, they got to restock the front court if Tobey's gone. And it looks like Felix Akpar would be one of those guys. It feels like Igor Milicic would be one of those guys. Uh, and if it gets to that point, it feels like for me, I think that's it for Tobey. I mean, for a guy that you know talks behind a camera and a microphone for a living, um, I, I I miss the John Smiths, the Grant Ramies, just just some <laughs> normal names out there. You got you mentioned Felix Akpara, who's coming in for an official visit Tuesday night. Again, this recording this on Tuesday afternoon. You broke him down a little bit. Tell us a little bit about Minnesota transfer guard Elijah Hawkins. Feels like Tennessee might just be in the beginning stages of evaluating and talking with him. Yeah, I think they're one of like 16, 17 programs, it feels like, that, that that reached out to him. I think Jamie Shaw had put out a list. I think I counted it, it was like 16 or 17. So uh, I do think they'll look at guards in the trans. – they're going to look for a combo guard, period, which I think they're doing, and they're doing their due diligence there. But I feel like they're a little bit more patient in that pursuit. I think they're waiting on uh, – I think they're trying to fill the front court, I should say. It feels like the emphasis is right there right now and trying to get that sewn up a little bit. And then maybe the focus goes to the combo guard and, and they'll wait and see who gets in the portal and all that stuff because they, they got a couple, what, uh, seven, eight more days or whatever it is at this point before the portal closes. So uh, I think they're a little bit more patient with that guard spot. But with uh, Elijah Hawkins, man, his, his his points, I think he's fourth best in college basketball in his assist numbers. Uh, and since he has a great point guard, uh, an elite point guard in Zakai Ziegler, uh, but you can never have enough ball handlers. I do think they, they're going to have to address the guard spot at some point, uh, and if, if Minnesota's Elijah Hawkins was one of those guys, uh, that would be huge because he's a really good basketball player and he's got everybody in the world after him because of it. So obviously it's um, it's fast-moving. Rick Barnes is trying to assemble his roster for next season, entering this phase of the offseason, then you know going into summer ball and all that type of stuff. Um, Darlington Stone Dubar, of course, committed late last week officially, or signed, I guess, uh, joined the team late last week officially. At the time of this recording, what is that? Still five open slots, right? That's still five open slots because they had seven. They lost three fifth-year seniors. They had four guys enter the portal. Uh, and then you had Bishop Boswell, the four-star point guard out of Charlotte, who signed in November. Uh, that gave you six open spots. Uh, and then you brought in Darlin Stone Dubar, who uh, signed last Thursday. That's five open spots. And it felt like Darlin Stone was a good start, uh, somebody that can fill some of that Josiah Jordan-James role in, in terms of the four and the versatility and, and being able to play different positions. And Rick Barnes talked a lot about how much he wants to defend, which is a big deal for Rick Barnes and, and playing this brand of basketball. And he's, a, he's supposed to be a really good offensive player as well. So it feels like a good start, but, yeah, they still got a lot of work to do. All right, Grant, out the door. Tell us uh, how far Tennessee is going to go next year in the tournament. Uh, second weekend, of course. That's my standard answer. Uh, the second weekend should be the uh, uh, the baseline kind of expectation. Um, it's 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 crazy. I don't know how much longer the sport can go at this pace, basically, in April, where it's insane free agency. And who knows what the team's going to look like uh, tomorrow, let alone. I know, that, that, you know, that's that's why whatever. I try to get you to laugh a little. That's why I Six actually. Six months from now. No, but I, I do think they, I mean, based on what they're looking at in the portal and based on what they have coming back and based on just kind of what you expect from a Rick Barnes basketball team, they're going to be in the hunt. They're going to be in the SEC towards the top of the league. And if you do that, you're, you're probably a second weekend team. And if they get in the tournament, they'll be in the top five seeds because that's all we've ever seen from Rick, right? All right, so Sweet 16, no matter what, says Grant Ramey, despite not first. knowing. April, whatever today is. Not knowing exactly who is going to be on this roster. Grant, as always, man, appreciate the update, and uh, we'll follow all your work and coverage over at VolQuest.com. Appreciate it, Eric. 
It is playoff time in the NBA, the NHL, baseball. It's in full swing with the regular season uh, happening right now. And FanDuel is your place to bet on every single game. Right now, new customers can get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed. That's $150 bucks if you win or lose. Bet on everything from slap shots to home runs to slam dunks all in this app that is safe, secure, Super easy to use. What are you waiting for? Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to make your first bet an automatic win. That is FanDuel. It's America's number one sports book. Again, $150 in bonus bets. Guaranteed. That's $150 bucks, win or lose. All at FanDuel.com slash locked on. FanDuel.com slash locked on to make your first bet an automatic win. FanDuel. It is America's number one sports book. All right. So the NFL draft is coming up. Tomorrow, first rounds tomorrow, rounds two and three are on Friday, and then four, five, six, seven on Saturday. And I'll speak with Josh about this here in a moment, but it really snuck up on me this year um, because last year we spent so much time on this show, and and I don't think the numbers really agree with it. So I'm glad I didn't kind of go down that direction this year. But you know, Hendon Hooker was you know potentially a first round. I know he went in the third round, but there was a lot of talk because he's a quarterback being a late first rounder. Of course, we know about Darnell Wright and Jalen Hyatt. There was some talk there about 25 to the Giants. He eventually went to the Giants, but in the third round, Byron Young, there was a lot of vols to kind of preview going into the NFL draft last year and some high end guys with, with Wright and hooker. Um, and, and this year there's not going to be quite as many, uh, but you do have Jalen Wright, who is going to be, in my opinion, a very, very solid day two pick. Okay. And, you know, you've got Kamal Haddon and quarterback Joe Milton and, and McCallan Castles and maybe some other guys who might have a chance of sliding in there in the sixth or the seventh round, but we'll get undrafted free agent deals for sure. So not as much to talk about, but I did think since the draft is starting tomorrow, and we'll have a little bit more on the draft on, on tomorrow's show because no balls will be taken in the first round this year. I did want to kind of set the scene a little bit on where these guys are kind of slated in the most recent mocks. You guys know I'm a huge fan of Jalen Wright. Shout out to Curtis and, and to, to Ryan, father and uncle of Jalen Wright, watching the show. And I uh, appreciate you guys always reaching out to me. And, and one day we're going to get Jalen on the show, I promise. It just hadn't worked out just yet. But uh, you guys know I'm a huge fan of Jalen Wright. And I'll tell you what, Mel Kuyper, huge fan of Jalen Wright. Of course, he is the the senior uh, NFL draft analyst over at ESPN. He's been doing it for, gosh, you know, one, two, three, four, I mean, four decades since Mel kuyper has been doing it over there at ESPN, and he loves Jalen Wright. He really does. He was listed among 13 of his favorite NFL draft prospects put out over at ESPN uh, this week. Um, he said, Wright made my list of risers after the combine where he put up a true 4-3-8-40, um, 11-foot two broad jump, 38-inch vertical leap, all of which ran close to the top at his position. He's a supreme athlete. His tape matches that two in 2023. He averaged 7.4 yards per carry, which ranked third in FBS, 4.1 yards after contact per carry, which ranked ninth. Um, he goes on to say Wright hits the hole def- decisively, but I love that he is a stellar pass blocker. He can handle blitzers and play on third downs in the NFL, and that's something he really, really improved with over his time at Tennessee. He caught only 30 passes in three seasons for the balls, but he has the tools to develop into a pass catcher. Uh, Kuyper and ESPN's his colleague Phil Yates um, they did that three-round mock draft. We talked about it a little bit last week on the show, and and they projected Wright to go number 77 overall to the Las Vegas Raiders. Of course, that's a third-round pick, um, you know, towards the middle or you know, early to mid third-round pick. ESPN's Jordan Reed in his seven-round mock draft had Wright going number 91 overall to the Green Bay Packers, which really, in my opinion, doesn't make a whole lot of sense because they've got two guys ahead of him there, but. I think Austin Dillon or AJ Dillon, AJ Dillon, it might be on his last year of his contract. But um, it looks like, according to Kuyper at least, that Jalen Wright is going to be his number two running back. Um, he says, "quote Wright is my number two running back, <laughs> but I project only one back, Texas's Jonathan Brooks, to be in the first two rounds of my latest mock draft, just based on the value of the position. I see Wright being picked early in round three and making an impact as a rookie. So we know Mel Kuyper Jr. is high on Jalen Wright." What about Jalen Wright? You know, kind of where is he slated? We saw third round there. Well, over there on ESPN, um, top NFL draft prospects coming into the week. Jalen Wright is at number 48 overall. And just because you listed as a top prospect overall doesn't mean you're going to be drafted in that position. I mean, Jalen Wright is not going to be drafted 48th overall, you know, for a second round pick. His his athletic ability might, might warrant that, but it's about 
draft need, team, position, all that and more that kind of determines where you're going to go. But Jalen Wright coming in as a top 50 overall draft prospect entering the NFL draft. Um, this is from Jeff Legwood of ESPN. In every draft, there are a handful of players who beg the question, why didn't he get more snaps? Wright is one of those players with a ridiculous workout numbers, his 40 time, 38 inch vertical, 11, 11 uh, 2 broad jump, a career 6.2 yards per attempt average, and the potential to have far more impact in the passing game. Wright has put the ball on the ground at times. He had four fumbles in 2022, but overall, he's had a fantastic career. And so I thought that was funny. Why didn't he get more snaps? And we talked about the three head monster last year. And um, go back to 2022, I thought Wright should have been the, the leader in that room. But why it worked so well in 2023, the three headed monster, is because none of those guys were ever, you know, were ever tired. And Jabari Small, Dylan Sampson, of course, Jalen Wright. But I would have loved to see what Wright could have done if he got the ball even more. So ESPN's high on him. He's a top 50 draft pick coming in at number 40 overall. This is what Jeremiah uh, Crawford said, or Daniel Jeremiah, excuse me. Jeremiah Crawford's a former Tennessee offensive tackle, and he'll look to get drafted this weekend as well. Daniel Jeremiah wrote last week on his uh, mocking of Jalen Wright to the third round. He said, Jalen Wright's so explosive and so dynamic in terms of finding fits for him, look, speed, playing elsewhere. I always go back to Kansas City continuing to add speed. I don't care how many running backs they have. When I see guys with big-time juice like that, that's the first thing that jumps out into my mind. And boy, Josh will hit on this in a moment. If Jalen Wright finds a way to Kansas City, oh, what a position to be in, right? What a position to be in. Let's talk about Kamal Haddon. Because of his shoulder injury, it looks like he's sliding down mock drafts. Daniel Jeremiah again talking about Tennessee's Kamal Haddon. He's got that shoulder surgery coming off that. Um, he's got some playmaking ability, but I think he's a late round pick as well. And um, it's unfortunate because Kamal Haddon was one of the better cornerbacks and one of the better players in the country at the time of his injury when he got hurt in game eight against Alabama last October on the third Saturday in October. According to Pro Football Focus, hadn't allowed 12 receptions on 33 targets last season. He was called for just two penalties in seven games. And if we dug deeper down in the Pro Football Focus stats, he was the highest ranked cornerback at the time in the country. So it looks like because of the injury, Kamal Haddon might slide, be a late round pick or an undrafted free agent. I bet he'll get picked for sure. That's one more big fish we got to talk about, and that's Joe Milton of quarterback. Um, Daniel Jeremiah says he phrases Joe Milton as a late round flyer. And I just disagree with that. Now I'm not saying that he's worthy of being a third or a fourth round pick, but again, we see this every year in the NFL draft. They just drool over the intangibles, the potential, the stature, you know, all that type of stuff. I mean, Joe Milton is physically the most impressing NFL draft prospect probably in, in this year's cycle. His play doesn't warrant that on the field. I recognize that but just potential, potential, potential. That's all you draft these guys for is potential. I can fix him. I can He'll, he'll be right in my system. Um, I'll get through to him. This is what Daniel Jeremiah said on quarterback Joe Milton. So it's kind of a tough combination to sell a little bit there. Um, I think he's a late-round flyer. In terms of just trying to find a team, I think you want to go somewhere where they've got a good quarterback developer, but I think that will be pretty late in the draft. I continue to think that Buffalo makes so much sense for Joe Milton because this game is very similar to that of Josh Allen um, in terms of being a big body quarterback, rocket arm. Of course, Josh Allen's one of the best quarterbacks in the NFL. He can do a whole lot more than Joe Milton, but I think that one would make a whole lot of sense. So Jalen Wright, early third round, likely. Okay, that's kind of where he's been mocked right now. Kamal Haddon, late round, undrafted. Joe Milton, late round flyer. I just don't think he's a flyer because I think somebody is going to sneak up and take him because – of all those intangibles that he possesses. But nonetheless, uh, we will see. We'll see exactly what happens with Joe Milton, Jalen Wright, Kamal Haddon, McCallum Castles, I think, is going to get an opportunity. And, of course, some other guys who I think will get opportunities um, as undrafted free agents. All right. Uh, watch uh, Josh Ward a little bit about this in segment number three for a little Ward Wednesday. That and more is coming up next. We continue on with the Wednesday Lockdown Balls. Okay, I've been told I'm a competitive person, all right? You might think that's true. You guys hear me every single day. I do have a competitive side, and we all do. I'd venture to say you do as well. My competitive side is a big fan of Monopoly Go. I'm sure you've heard of it. It's been downloaded 150 million times. It's a great twist on Monopoly, where you play not only on one board, but hundreds of Monopoly boards 
uh, across the country in, in crazy locations, building up amazing cities that bring you big money. The best part is messing with my friends. I can now charge them rent on my iconic properties, just like Classic Monopoly. But now I can also heist their vaults and riches for myself. It's like the Halloween heist on steroids, right? And all the li all the leaderboards show me who the biggest monopoly tycoon is but it's not just my competitive side that loves it you can team up with friends and people all around the world in time tournaments to earn huge rewards so get in the game join your friends today download monopoly go it is free in the app store and in google play so big shout out to monopoly go and big shout out to game time uh, it is the app for procrastinators for like you and me in fact the tickets that you can purchase on the game time app actually get cheaper the closer the event happens and they're selling tickets to these sporting events concerts monster truck rallies whatever it is even up to an hour after the event is taking place you can cash in over at game time by downloading that app uh, put in the promo code Locked On College, and you're going to get twenty dollars off your first purchase for new users. Create that account, Locked On College, L O C K E D O N C O L L E G E. That is the promo code Locked On College for twenty dollars off, lowest price guarantee, event cancellation protection, job loss protection. It is the place to buy your tickets to your next sporting events or whatever events, concerts. Uh, monster truck rallies, everything going on at TBA at the FCC here in, in, in Knoxville, right? You can buy tickets over on the Game Time app. Again, promo code Locked On College, twenty dollars off your first purchase. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guarantee. We got Josh Ward coming up next as we continue on with a Wednesday Locked On Vols. Josh Ward, he's a co-host of Josh and Swain on 991 The Sports Animal, former host here at Locked On Vols. He joins us every Wednesday for a hit called Ward Wednesday. Josh, uh, let's start with football. Basketball is kind of the talk right now, but football, only one player in the transfer portal at the time of this recruiting. That is linebacker Elijah Herring. There was some scuttle there on a Monday afternoon that Jason Jenkins, defensive lineman, was contemplating entering the portal. That's where we are in sports now. It's It's expected or thinking about going into the portal and then oh no there's a new story oh well he decided he's not going to go into the portal uh but that's just kind of where we are i i do think that um it kind of speaks to the culture and what tennessee and josh hopple have going on here yeah it's quiet on the hill with tennessee football both players going and coming uh, elijah herring was a quality player so losing him means somebody that has to be replaced that could help i think tennessee staff would have preferred him to not leave but they also have players available at linebacker. And it, the defensive line position, I think it's been the most active position group in college football, which makes sense. There are a lot of guys that play along the defensive line in the sport, but Tennessee's held on to them. Now, that can change. That's uh, a subject to change conversation at any point when you're talking about any school. But to this point, I think it does speak to what Tennessee is building, the players buying into the program, and if we're talking about this position specifically, Jenkins and the defensive line, those guys believing in the power and numbers, the chance to play a bigger role in the future after some of the rising seniors leave this year, there is uh, development for the current group, but also potential to keep that going over the next two or three years with the way they've recruited. So uh, it, it's a good position for Tennessee. Somebody could opt in at any point in time, and this might be a dated statement by the time you say that, but across the board, I think Tennessee's coaches have to feel good about how this spring window has uh, – how it's developed from its own roster. Yeah, hey, Jason Jenkins is a guy that got, you know received a lot of praise from Rodney Gardner and, and some of his teammates in uh, spring practice. He's a guy that got a little bit of PT last year, um, but he's going to be a part of that 10 to 14 rotation, 10 to 14 man rotation. Let me ask you this. Um, since you've been covering Tennessee football and you've been around it obviously your entire life, I think there's two different questions. I think – this is the deepest Tennessee's defensive line has ever been since we, you and you and I both can remember. Maybe not the most talented. Of course, there were two first round picks back in 2001, 2002 with, with of course, Albert Hainsworth and, and John Henderson. But this is probably top to bottom, probably one of the best units that has ever been here at Tennessee since you and I have been around the program. But would you agree with that? I, I just think that, again, Tim Banks' comment at the beginning of spring practice is, it's carrying some weight hitting on into the summer. Yeah, uh, there's an elite player on the edge there with James Pierce, a, a future first-round pick, top 10 pick, uh, might be the best defensive prospect next year. And then there are a bunch of guys that can play for Tennessee, maybe a few of them with 
some all SEC or pro potential, but it's about the amount of guys that Tennessee can put on the field and trust. We've talked about depth on this show, and sometimes when we talk about depth, we're talking about actual numbers of players, and then other times we're talking about talent. Yeah, You can have 15 guys, 20 guys, but if the coaches don't trust them to go on the field and play, you don't have depth. I think Rodney Gardner and Tim Banks trust a lot of players on the defensive line to go out and play. So since I've been around Tennessee football, covering it in some way, that 0-1 defensive line was just terrific when you have those two guys on the interior. Will Overstreet, who was a third-round pick as well on the defensive line. From a top tier, you're not going to do much better than that. But with the amount of players that Tennessee has, guys that are legitimate SEC defensive linemen to where they can deal with two or three guys going down. I mean, Pierce could change the conversation, but everywhere else, if they lose players, they could say, okay, next guy goes in, yeah. and we're going to trust the rotation to continue to produce. That That is what will give Tennessee a chance to compete with everybody this fall. I think it was one of the first times Rodney Garner ever, ever spoke to us, um, and he kind of – detailed what he's done in the past and he was talking about being at Auburn the year before he got here and he was like I think we had or no he was talking about the Auburn team that went to the national championship he was like I think we had 11 different starting lineups on the defensive line that year um and he was like it's once for for a big man once the tank hits empty you can't really go and refill it during a game you're just done so that's why he believes and the deep rotation, and, and I, I like that a lot. I think it makes a whole lot of sense. Long gone of the days, right? Remember Pruitt's first year back in, I guess, 2018, 2019, the first, second year when they were playing literally four to five guys on the defensive line, albeit you're, talent, you're more talented now, but it feels like a lifetime ago where you were playing four or five men on the defensive line, and now you're playing 13. Yeah, Daniel Hood's a guy that have, I've gotten to do a lot of work with on the sports animal, former defensive lineman, was a senior in 13 when Butch Jones took over. And the amount of snaps that those guys were having to play was wild. Like they, there were times they just couldn't leave the field. And they, they stood no chance to hold no. up over the course of the season. And they they also on that team, they they didn't have the level of talent, let alone the the depth of available players that we're talking about for Tennessee right now and there is real potential with some other players like i'm excited to see for tennessee what david hobbs can do after playing last year being a part of the rotation as a freshman tyree weathersby is another guy that they like what he was what he's able to do what he was able to do before his injury last year so we'll see what kind of progress players are able to make joshua josephs in his third year so players that are getting more of an opportunity how much better they can be because i think it's fair to trust and expect that there will be development of a lot of guys. Tyree West is another player that we've talked about with his ability. So I'm not saying everybody is going to develop into a big time player, but with Rodney Garner coaching and the legitimate competition they have, the hit rate should be pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. No doubt about it. Hey, some guys who have come through Tennessee's program are now going on to the professional careers. Big end of the weekend coming up, right? Thursday, Friday, and Saturday with the NFL draft. I mean, it really snuck up on me this year. I spent so much time, like, and of course, quarterback kind of changes the conversation, Darnell Wright. I spent mm -hmm. a lot of time on this program previewing the NFL draft last year. This year, it looks like Jalen Wright's safely going to be, you know, a, a third round pick, maybe, maybe a late second, but a day two pick. And then you got Kamal Haddon, who might be a late round pick, Joe Milton, who's projected to be a late round flyer, according to... Jeremiah Crawford and some others. Jim McCallum Castles might be in that conversation. What do you kind of make of Tennessee's going into the weekend of the NFL draft? And how excited would you be if old Jalen Wright was drafted to your Raiders? Yeah, I've tried to make it happen a little bit on the show. Swain's tried to shoot it down every time. There have been a number of teams connected to Jalen Wright when you look at the different mock drafts, and that's a good thing. The more teams that could potentially be interested. Everybody needs running back help, and once they get to the third round, I think they're willing to go get somebody they think can be a playmaker, and Jalen has that ability both as a runner and a receiver, high-end speed at his size. So he's an attractive prospect probably in the third round. If he can jump up into the second round, great for him. Swain tried to push for the Chiefs to add him into the offense with the last pick of the second round. So if he were to play for Andy Reid, that'd be great for Jalen Wright for sure in that Patrick Mahomes yeah. offense. But he's a, I, I think he's a really good NFL prospect with the different things he's able to do the weight that he was able to add and the run that he made against Georgia to show that that speed is still there, that that first play uh, to start out that game, I think that was probably a lot of what NFL teams needed to see in terms of his physical ability. So right offense, right fit, right opportunity. 
all of that's going to matter. But I think Jalen Wright's going to find a good spot where he can help immediately as a rookie. Basketball transfer portal, a lot of names that Tennessee is in on right now. Looks like Igor, Tennessee's kind of the front runner for him. And um, big man, what would Tennessee be getting if they were to uh, you know, land the commit of him at some point this week? And, of course, Kay Tyson uh, battling North Carolina for that one. Tennessee's in on some other ones. How, how are you liking the portal strategy for Rick Barnes and, and his staff? Well, if Tennessee does land Igor Milicic Jr., as the Vols have a, a great chance to, it would seem, at the time of this conversation, I'm intrigued by his role and what he can do for Tennessee. He would be, to me, the first true stretch big man that Rick Barnes has had, a guy that has proven he can take and make the outside shot behind the three-point line. Think about all the big guys that Tennessee has had under Rick Barnes. We saw Grant Williams develop into a three-point shooter in the NBA that was not his role at Tennessee. Jonas Adu, I do think, has that potential. Maybe at his next stop, he's able to show that. We haven't seen it yet. So if Milicic adds that, a, a legitimate big man in terms of size with the three-point shooting ability, that can change spacing for Tennessee's offense. I, I still wonder on the defensive side, rebounding, what else can they add? So a player like Felix Akpara from Ohio State, uh, shot-blocking ability as well in the defensive end, that would matter a lot. Because Jonas Adu, remember, was an all-defensive player in the SEC. He did some good things on the defensive end for Tennessee. That has to be replaced. But the Vols are in a pretty good position, having already added Dubar from Hofstra. Landing Cade Tyson against UNC is an uphill battle. Tennessee remains in the mix. He would be a tremendous uh, threat for the uh, from the outside. So more outside shooting help. Milicic could add that. If they can add one more there, plus another big man to help with defense and rebounding, then Tennessee will have remade this roster quite nicely. It is fast and furious, Tennessee and the transfer portal, not just basketball, but a little bit of football as well, and we'll see how it all plays out as the transfer portal window continues to march on. Hey, Josh, uh, what's coming up this week on the show? And, of course, you got the Josh and Swain newsletter every Friday, 8.30 in the morning Eastern time. And if anybody wants to subscribe to that Josh and Swain newsletter, it is in the show description of, uh, of this episode. Yeah, thank you for sharing that link. So that'll be out Friday morning. It's free. And uh, Portal Watch continues. We've had a lot of portal frustrations shared with us by listeners and viewers to the show. Totally get it. So you can uh, vent those frustrations with us. And then the NFL draft talk. We'll, we'll have some of that. Swain's high on uh, Jalen Wright, as a lot of NFL people are, and what he'll be able to do at the next level. So we'll be watching leading up to it and reacting to it on Friday. Josh, appreciate it as always, man. Thanks so much. You got it. Thanks, Eric. All right, that is Josh Ward, co-host of Josh and Swain, VFL Jason Swain on 99.1 The Sports Animal, noon to three weekdays. And, of course, you can hear him every single Wednesday right here on Locked On Balls. Appreciate you guys for being here and joining us here today and uh, making us your first listen, your first watch. You every day is for coming back, as always. Couldn't do this show without you. Uh, big week coming up next week as we continue to kind of see where Tennessee is maybe a week from today in terms of basketball on the transfer portal expect a couple of commits in my opinion we'll see what Tennessee continues to do in the in the football transfer portal recruiting it's it's getting hot guys and there's no better place to be staying up to date to all that than right here on Lockdown Balls thanks so much for joining us we'll be back on a Thursday this is Lockdown Balls 